to all. Uh, so basically, uh, I want to start a sort of like series of discussion on quantum error corrections. So uh, basically, this is an abstract. So uh, I hope that we can sort of like pick up uh, this new research area in quantum error corrections and uh, combining with uh, basically what our group is strongest, which is uh, geometry and quantum error corrections. So uh, there are actually quite a few references that uh, already started to es establish uh, the connection between uh, the geometry and quantum error corrections. Uh, I suppose I gave that link in the WhatsApp group. So basically, for the moment, I will just follow this book by Gaitan. And then uh, if you want other references, uh, you can refer from two to five. So later on, I will just upload uh, my slides to the WhatsApp group. So a uh, particular mention is uh, the lectures by Cortesman, which is recorded. And then uh, there's also lecture notes. And then uh, most importantly, chapter seven and chapter nine by Presque. So uh, if you have time and you want to catch up, you can just focus on four and five mostly. So uh, the reason why I want to divide this discussion into two parts, a uh, paper reading and then a book reading, is because uh, I just hope that eventually we can sort of like uh, look at the, the, the latest development of QEC while we are also working on the fundamentals. So, uh, of course, for the moment, the, the kind of papers that I'm reading is kind of random, and then it's, it's also very old papers. So, uh, the paper that I read like last week is by Cortesman on uh, fault tolerant quantum computation. You can find this paper in archive, and it is in 2007. So, basically, uh, I just want to talk more about like, what is fault tolerant. So uh, if we have a kind of like quantum computers and we have a circuitry for, for an algorithm to work, so basically uh, that error correction code is only useful if uh, we assume that the kind of quantum gates and then all the implementations, they are perfect. But uh, in the real world, they are not perfect. So then, uh, we need to introduce what is called the fault tolerance uh, protocols to prevent uh, the errors from propagating throughout the quantum circuits. So uh, basically, it is divided into three parts. Uh, we need to prepare our state so that uh, our state itself is not uh, contain, does not contain any errors. And then uh, we also need to consider how to measure the states without collapsing the states and then uh, lastly we need to talk about like uh, how can we implement the gates such that the the errors won't propagate throughout your quantum circuits so uh, as we sort of like discuss a little bit uh, in the kickstarter discussion last time so basically uh, when we measure quantum states uh, we always collapse the states but uh, there's also a non debilitant way of uh, measuring the states. That is, if we couple with an ancilla and then we measure the ancilla. So uh, the way that we, we already saw this is by using the CNOP gates to couple our quantum states to the ancilla and then measure it. So we saw it in the bit fit code and then the face fit code last time. So mostly we will try to use the non-demolition way of measurement. And then, um, but we need to note that because uh, we are adding adding some complexity in, in, in circuit if we try to measure by non-demolition way. So uh, 
if let's say the, the, the end result of our calculations, uh, let's say from the data block itself, uh, it contains some errors. So essentially we are copying the errors to the ancilla and then we try to measure the ancilla and see where are the errors, right? So while doing this, the error actually also propagates back to the data block by itself. So uh, one way to think about this is that uh, if you consider from a thermodynamics point of view, so basically errors are just uh, heat and then uh, they introduce entropy to the system. So uh, when we have some ancillary states, basically we prepare the states uh, freshly in a sense. So uh, you can talk of it as uh, some cool ancillary states. And then uh, what the error correction does is to pump the heat from our data into the ancilla. So this acts like a refrigerator, but because the ancilla, I mean, we cannot cool the, the, the data block uh, below the temperature of the ancilla. So uh, there's a limit to what we can do about error correction. However, uh, because the ancilla we, we freshly prepared, so we can sort of like control how much error inside the ancilla states. So which is meant by we can prevent it by heating it, heating the data block too much. So this is what it meant by, by this sentence. So uh, the second part is uh, the state preparation. So usually uh, what we can do is we prepare two states and then we try to check whether these two states are the same or not by the non dimension measurement if they are not the same then we can discard the states and repeat the procedure we we make two states again and then we try to compare it but uh, there is a risk of let's say if two of the states are getting the same error so we measure it and then uh, okay we, we think that they are the same but actually they contains the error so uh, there's always this kind of risk so the third part is uh, about the preparation of fault tolerant gates so uh, this includes uh, two things i think the first one is to uh, the implementation implementation of our gates so uh, instead of having some messy codes, we actually prefer having some transversal gates, whereby if let's say this gate is just acting on on the i the i qubit, then uh, we always want to make sure that the code is perfect such a way that uh, it doesn't interact with uh, other qubits. Because uh, then if there is something happened to the gate, whereby the gate introduced some errors. So the error will only stay on i qubits and not the other qubits. So uh, we know that from Shaw's 9 qubit codes, uh, it can effectively protect one qubit from one error. So then we can sort of like estimate some threshold for this uh, errors and see what are the best results with, so that uh, we can still have a quantum computer. So if we estimate the probability of a single error happening inside a physical gate to be P, then uh, having two errors inside a physical gate will be P squared. So we know that uh, if we have two errors, so basically, uh, the, the error correction code won't be able to protect us from two errors. So this is uh, the kind of uh, threshold that we want to measure. So if we have some C, which depends on the circuits. So this C is a number of pair of location where two physical errors can occur. So basically, if you have two physical errors, then it will cause a logical error because uh, our error correction code cannot correct it. So uh, then uh, within a block of error correction, then basically 
the total probability of having two errors will be CP squared. Then uh, we can sort of like estimate the uh, threshold errors. So uh, if let's say your threshold, uh, your probability of having an error is less than your threshold errors, then it is an improvement because we know that uh, our error correction actually corrects the error before the second pair of errors occur. But if this is larger than P or T, then uh, the extra qubits and the extra gates that we introduce during the error correction actually introduce more errors faster than we can correct them. So then uh, this is not an improvement in this case. And then if we substitute P to be the physical error rate per gate, then uh, we can sort of like estimate like how long before before our how long that we can proceed in our circuit before uh, error occurs so because uh, now this p is the rate error rate right so then basically we can compute one to the uh, inverse the inverse of p times before we have an error so with uh, this p which is uh, introduced due to the error correction, then uh, the computation time that we have is one over CP squared. So this is uh, an improvement to the original computation that we can do before we met an error. So we can uh, improve the, the, the limit further by concatenating our codes. So for example, if uh, for show codes, we, we need five physical, uh, nine physical qubits to encode one qubit. So now each one of the qubit may further encode it with nine physical qubits. So with uh, the show codes that we showed last week, so that means uh, we will need 81 physical qubits just to encode a single qubit. Then uh, this error part, we further drop to uh, this value. So you can, in principle, you can concatenate your code uh, repeatedly. And then uh, after care levels, you get uh, your effective logical error rate to be this number. But as we can see, the number of physical qubits that you need to encode a qubit by using this concatenated code, increase like exponentially. So essentially, we don't have a large number of qubits to do quantum error correction in this sense. So uh, the last part that I want to cover in the paper is that uh, basically the error model that we are currently considering is a very simple model. We consider only x, y, z on sub, uh, on on your separable separate gates at separate times and then each of the errors they have independent probabilities but uh, whether this kind of error actually uh, you can approximate it, approximate it to the realistic scenario uh, we are not sure so there are other error models that we can consider. So one such error model is a uh, adversarial probabilistic channel, whereby uh, now we choose the errors randomly and uh, they, they are independent from each other. And then the error that we choose and the place that we uh, choose to have the errors, uh, they are chosen to cause maximum harm to the computation. And in the most gen general case, uh, we should really consider uh, a such a, a such open quantum system, whereby the environment is interacting weakly with the system. So uh, I think this is the hardest to study. And basically, the, the Pauli errors is the easiest to study. 
So uh, with this, uh, perhaps uh, I will just go into the book. So uh, basically, this presentation is just to introduce the notations. Uh, even though we are doing quantum error questions, a lot of the terminologies and ideas are borrowed from classical error corrections. So uh, we need to look at uh, some of the notions of uh, classical error questions. So uh, with some noisy communication, basically what we are trying to do is to retrieve the information that was sent through a noisy channel, noisy communication channel, as reliably as possible. So uh, we don't actually aim to perfectly retrieve the information, but if let's say there is a very reliable way to uh, retrieve our information back, I think this is good enough. So the way error correction codes work, as we all see earlier, uh, is to add some redundancy to the uh, data that we have so that uh, we can uh, detect the errors and then remove from the data that we receive at the end. So uh, in the book, they focus on the linear error correcting codes only. So uh, if we let our message to be a vector m, uh, so at the moment we, we keep everything general, so uh, this is a column vector m1 until mk, and uh, each of these m actually is either 0 or 1. So, uh, so m1 is 1 bit, so over here I have k bits. Uh, this vector is actually living inside uh, this k-dimensional vector space, uh, whereby uh, each of the vector space is just 0 and 1. So that's why the, fi the field is finite, which is F2 and 0 and 1. So uh, we can define addition and multiplication. And this is of modular 2. So if you have 0, 0, so you get 0. 1, 0, you, uh, 0, 1, you get 1. 1, 0, you get 1. And 1, 1, get 0. And then if it is multiplication, it's only one and one, you get one. So uh, because of this uh, finite field, uh, they have some very special property, such as uh, if you have some, some uh, number A, uh, the inverse is also A. So that's why A plus A equals to zero. So by inverse, I mean the addition inverse. So uh, that's why A is equals to minus A. And if you have uh, A minus B, it is also equivalent to A plus B. So this is, a, I think, property for uh, finite field F2. And then uh, this message, we further encode it into the, what we call as the code word. Uh, so C1 correspond to M1 until CK correspond to MK. So from uh, K plus 1 until N is what we call as the parity bit. Uh, and then uh, we need to perform the parity checks. So the parity checks is just uh, some vectors uh, you uh, multiply with your code words and then it satisfies this uh, equation, which is equal to zero in this case. So these uh, parity checks are also, are also called constraints. So uh, we can put all these uh, constraints or vectors into a matrix for the parity check matrix. And uh, of course, uh, this is the notation that he used, uh, basically you just transpose your originally I think this should be uh, 
row matrix. Yeah, it should be a row matrix. So uh, you just, OK, perhaps I'm mixed up with something else. For the moment, just take the transpose as the row matrix. Uh, I think there is some notation issues over here from the book because I copied exactly from the book. Uh, but never mind. Uh, let's just uh, consider this transpose to be a row matrix. So you have uh, n minus k uh, parity checks. And then uh, we can see that the, because they are linearly independent, so the rank of this matrix is n minus k, and they fix uh, n minus k parity check roots, which is from k plus one until n. So uh, basically, once you write it into a matrix, uh, equation two can be written as equation four in this case. Yeah, I think this this should be transposed because uh, equation two will fit into equation three once you make this into a row matrix. So uh, another property of uh, this code word is that if you have two code words, the addition of them is also a code word because uh, Code words basically needs to satisfy this equation. So if you try to perform this, you can already see that they are zero. And then if you have a scalar from the finite field, then the scalar multiplied with the code word is, is also the code word because uh, you can do it this way. So then we define a kind of like a vector space the linear code C. So in this vector space, basically you have a parity check matrix H, and then you have uh, your code word, which is uh, C. And they say this part equation for over here. So uh, this linear code is close under vector addition, which is over here, and then scalar multiplication, which is over here which is why I said they form a vector space and it is a k-dimensional subspace of your original space. Uh, so it should be here. So uh, the other part is about the code words. So if we define some k vectors to be the basis set of the code words, then we can expand our code words in terms of the basis states. Whereby, uh, again, your MJ is just uh, from your final field. And MJ basically is your message over here. Then uh, we can introduce another matrix called the generator matrix G, uh, which is just your consists of your uh, basis states. And then we can combine equation five with six to equation seven, basically. So uh, with equation seven, then we can just multiply the parity check matrix in front of here. And this is equal to zero, right? So because of here, so we can conclude that h multiplied with g equals to zero. So uh, you can, okay, because your uh, parity check matrix, the rank of it is uh, n minus k. So you can always uh, perform some matrix row operations such that uh, you can stick to this notation, which is equation nine. Uh, if you read some other references, the identity matrix is in front instead of at the back. So I just follow the notation from the book. So basically you have some matrix A and then 
identity matrix n minus k. So again, because of equation eight and nine, so you can sort of see that if you want this multiplication to be zero and these two are block matrix, so essentially your G has to be in this form so that when they multiply together, they, they become zero. So the next thing is uh, coming from equation eight. So if you perform a matrix transpose, we see that uh, this kind of transpose becomes a G transpose, H transpose equals to zero. So if we redefine uh, some of the parts over here, so we redefine uh, H transpose to be G oh, and then H uh, G transpose to be H hook. So then uh, we can sort of see that this is actually just a dual code to the original linear code C. So we can define a dual code such that uh, now this becomes your generator matrix and then this becomes your parity track matrix. So uh, I, yeah, I think I forgot to mention. So uh, linear code C with uh, this, this kind of parity track matrix H and then uh, your code word C. Basically, they are referring to NK code. Okay, so now uh, with uh, the dual code defined, then basically we can sort of like uh, formally say that uh, your code words in your dual code, they actually are orthogonal to your code words by itself. So uh, another thing that we need to see because of the finite field is that uh, if a vector in, in F2, uh, they have even number of non-zero components, for example, one, 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 zero, zero. So if you do the, the inner product, you find that they are actually orthogonal to itself. So meaning that in this example, uh, your code word can belong to your linear code and then your orthogonal code. If they are equal, then this linear code is called a self-dual code. If your uh, linear code is a subset of your dual code, then it is weakly self-dual. So now, uh, what is an error? So an error basically is, uh, you, you have some encoded message, encoded code words in, the, in this case, and then you send it through a channel, and let's say I receive it. So when I receive the, the message, I de denote it as Y. So then I compare with uh, your original code word, and uh, what is being subtracted over here is the error vectors. But note that this is a ideal scenario because I know what is the original code word. So uh, in reality, this is not the case. So uh, again, we are studying a very simple error models. So in a binary symmetric channel, so how does this error occurs? Basically, uh, we assume that the errors occurring on several bits, they are not correlated, and then the probability is, is always the same. And again, because you only have a bit flip in this case, so it's either uh, you flip it or you don't flip it. So that's why uh, the error probability should be less than half. So there are a lot of ways for us to decode a message. So in um, what we call as the maximum likelihood decoding strategy, 
So we just try to return to the best guess of the original message. So uh, the best guess is just the one what we receive and what we estimate the error to be. So uh, like I mentioned here before, we can obtain the exact error vector because we know what is the code word. But in reality, we don't know this. So what we can do is we guess what is this, and then we estimate the error. So we also need a way to measure the distance. So we define what is called the Hemming weight. The Hemming weight is just uh, if you have a vector, let's say 0, 1, 0, 0, you just count how many components are uh, 1. So in my case, just now 0, 1, 0, 0. So there's only one component is 1. So the Hemming weight is 1. So uh, with Hemming weight defined, your Hemming distance is just uh, the Hemming weight between the difference of x and y. So we find that uh, this Hemming distance actually satisfies the properties of a metric function. Uh, the first two, I think, is easy to prove. The last one requires a little bit of thinking. So basically, you need to compare component-wise and uh, convince yourself that uh, the addition of uh, this Hamming distance and this Hamming distance is either equal to x and, uh, the Hamming distance of x, y, component-wise, or it is bigger than uh, the Hamming distance of x and y. So uh, you can actually prove this. So in this uh, binary symmetric channel, if you have new bits of errors occurring, and uh, let's say your total number of bits is n, so then uh, by, by standard uh, probability calculations, we know that uh, the probability that this event occurs is just uh, given by p multiplied with uh, new bits, and then the rest should be 1 minus p and then to the power of n minus new. So uh, this is a probability that some error vectors with uh, new bits occur. So uh, also with the Hamming distance defined, uh, basically your maximum likelihood uh, decoding is equivalent to the nearest neighbor decoding. And uh, what is nearest neighbor decoding? Nearest neighbor decoding basically means that uh, you try to decode your code word uh, that is uh, the least distance with respect to the Hamming distance from your receive vector. And one important property of uh, code word is that uh, your minimum distance, which is uh, given by this part, because uh, this over here is just uh, C minus C dash, right? So uh, C minus C dash is also your code words. So in this case, uh, your minimum distance is just equivalent to your weight of your code words by itself. But uh, of course, your code words should not be equal to zero in this case. So then finally, uh, when we know the number of bits that we use to encode our message, and then uh, the message itself, and then the minimum distance, uh, we have the complete information of what is a linear code, which is given by NKD. So, uh, okay. So, uh, this is actually somewhat a result from linear algebra. So, basically, uh, because uh, our parity check matrix is of rank n minus k, right? So, uh, 
if you look at the columns by itself, if it is D columns, they are always linearly dependent. But if it is D minus one, they are linearly independent. So uh, this is just some results from linear algebra. And then uh, lastly, a linear code with a minimum distance D can correct up to the flow function of uh, this number bits of error. So uh, because I introduced so many notations and without any examples, uh, so we can sort of like consider the easiest example. If let's say we repeat, let's say the, the message that we have is zero and one, and then we repeat it three times. So it's zero, 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 and one, one, one. So we already discussed uh, before that this can correct one error by majority rule. So uh, in this case, uh, the n is equals to three, the k equals to one, and then d equals to three. So why d equals to three? Because your code word, your, your code word is only zero, 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 and one, one, one. The rest, they have errors. So if you look at the minimum distance, uh, basically is the weight of one on one, which is three. Uh, I think this is my last slide. So, yeah. That's all from me. Any questions or comments? Sounds, it sounds so complicated. <laughs> uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's not complicated, but uh, they state results from, from linear algebra in linear algebra. the sense. Yeah, yeah uh, one of the things that, you know, basically you're, you're just playing around with your binary numbers, right? Yes. I suppose one could have actually Yes. Or you can even think, for example, the triangle inequality. Mm -hmm. One could just think of it as the, you know, you have a vector space, which is uh, over Z2. So you can mm -hmm. sort of carry over what whatever proofs for the ordinary vector space over to the F2 vector space. Uh isn't f2 just z2 i mean huh? isn't that f2 space is just your z2 space yeah, yeah. it's just different different alphabet <laughs> <laughs> no the, the, the important thing over there is the fact that uh z2 is a field so that's what they call it f2 right yeah and uh okay regarding to the last part uh, let me show it again. So, uh, okay, uh, another question. When they, you know, those uh, numbers that they, the NKD thing, mm -hmm. what is actually uh, precisely known at the beginning? Precisely what? Uh, which is as seems like to be given. Or is it, you know, that depends on the, different cases or what uh i think for each code uh i mean it's kind of like standardized written in that way so you know uh the number of uh, I'm, I'm talking about practical situations for example you're trying to transmit certain things so this nkd which one of it is going to be given uh I'm not so sure about that, but like, for example, if you look at Shaw's code again, so it's, if, no, if I'm not mistaken, it's 913. So mm -hmm. meaning you use nine qubits to encode one qubit, and then you can, your, your distance is basically three. So, uh, in the, the Shaw case, yep. that is already considering 
uh, qubits, right? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, the same kind of notation being used for the? It is considered qubits. So showcase is a uh, conduct error correction, yeah. but they are also using notation from from the classical. Okay. So, uh, so that's why I think uh, it's important to introduce the note. So, so the, the 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 in reality they are supposed to represent different things. The, what, the notation answer. Uh, I, what do you mean by different things? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, the the QEC thing. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, just simply adopt the notation used by the classical error correction, right? Yeah. yeah. So, but uh, you wouldn't want to say that uh, no the the notation that you use uh, for classical case uh, can always be adopted for the case of a quantum error case, right? That's what. Uh... I mean. Okay, I'm not so sure when we are going into the geometric codes whether it is still possible to to write that NKT. But uh, at least for for okay, at least for classical error corrections, uh, the notion of D is actually quite important because uh, it means that. Okay, like like the the repetition code. So you just basically you just copy the zeros to to include three three zeros zero 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 and one one one, right? So whenever your error is uh, of Hamming distance less than three, you can always uh, detect and correct it. But if it is a uh, distance larger than larger than three, then you can't do it. So that's why the D is included in in the description of your error code. But I'm not so sure for uh, for other error correction codes. I mean, especially the quantum ones, whether we still need this kind of notation or not. But for the moment. Uh, I've seen quite a few error correction codes. They they still adopt this notation. Okay. Any more questions? Should I turn off the recording or? <laughs> or... Perhaps you can turn off the recording. Okay.